Good morning. Welcome to Central. If you have a Bible, turn to John 19, John chapter 19. That's where we're going to camp out over the next uh, few weeks as we begin a series uh, called Highlands. Now, as you turn to John 19, please note that John 18 and John 19 mark the lowest points in John's gospel. So the tone and the feel have been steadily going down in the fourth gospel for quite a while. And when we get to John 19, we reach that lowest point. But what we discover in John's gospel is that contrary to the old adage that what goes up must come down, in John's gospel, what goes down will actually come up. And so John 18 and 19, the lowest points in the gospel, will be followed by John 20 and John 21, words that tell us no matter where we are, God meets us, that what goes down will not stay down, it will come up. That's the hope of Easter. And one of the amazing things about John 19 is that even though what we read is so unjust, If you love Jesus, what we read is so painful. What is so amazing is that Jesus just embraces all of this injustice with a calm and peaceable spirit. And our prayer through this series is not only would we uh, catch a glimpse of the Father's love for us in sending Christ to the cross, but also we would be able to perceive Jesus' obedience and also the hope and the joy that he had knowing what his suffering would produce. And I pray that that would be incredible, but more than that, I pray that we would recognize that in Jesus' example here, we can also experience the peace, the calm, the inner poise that comes through a relationship with God that no matter where we find ourselves, no matter what we are traveling through, God will meet us there and he will not lead us in, leave us in the valley. He will take us to the mountaintop. He will. Now, if you have a Bible, turn to uh, John 19. I'm going to read from verses 1 through 5. John 19, 1 through 5. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. The soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and they put it on his head. They clothed him in the purple robe and went up to him again and again saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And they slapped him in the face. Once more, Pilate came out and said to the Jews gathered there, Look, I am bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no basis for a charge against him. When, Pilate came out wearing, uh, when Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, Pilate said to them, here is the man. Some of your translations there say, behold the man. Behold the man. Now, John 19 is not a trial in the strictest sense of the term because in John 18, verse 38, Pilate declared that this man was innocent of every crime. But in between the acquittal, acquittal and the crucifixion of Jesus, we find Pilate trying to maneuver his way around those circumstances. And and caught between Pilate's political maneuvering and the religious establishment's evil intent, you have Jesus, seemingly a victim, and yet someone who is incredibly calm. And I think from John 19, what we realize here as we apply this to our own life is that low moments become high points when we are as resilient in our trial as Jesus was resilient in his. We find strength when the path goes up, when we allow God to cultivate resilience in our own hearts. I want you to think and to ponder and to meditate on the word resilience. I believe God wants to make us a more resilient people. Now, resilience is exemplified by Jesus in John chapter 19 is that unwavering ability to remain steadfast. It is maintaining that inner peace in the face of suffering, injustice, 
and adversity. From Jesus' actions in John 18, we recognize that resilience is not simply endurance. It goes beyond endurance. Resilience is marked by that calm, that peaceable spirit that is rooted in the confidence that God will vindicate us even if that vindication is delayed. Jesus shows us here that a resilient spirit navigates the low points in life. It has the strength to confront sin and death squarely in the face, and it remains true to what is right regardless of external pressure and external circumstances. Now, the question we can ask as we go through John 19, and I'm sure as we go through this in the subsequent weeks, you, like me, will marvel at how Jesus manages to do all of this. The question that comes to my mind over and over again is, how did Jesus do this? How was Jesus so calm and so peaceful amidst such injustice, pain, and suffering? And of course, whenever you ask a question of Jesus, you need to ask the question of his two natures. All too often, I think we ask questions like this, or we refuse to ask questions like this because we make the false assumption. We assume that Jesus was calm through all of this because he was God, and well, God never gets flustered. But I've said this over and over again. If that's what we do with the text, we not only rob the obedient son of man of his true glory and of what obedience looks like, but we also deprive ourselves of the opportunity of experiencing what Jesus himself demonstrated. See, the Son of God did not take on flesh to act like God, but to act like the sons and daughters of God should have acted, but because of the controlling power of sin, they could not. He wanted to show us what was possible with God through the Spirit. And so, if we're simply going to say Jesus could do all of this, remain calm under such a trial because he was God, we rob him of his humanity. And if we rob him of his humanity, we rob him of the ability to actually save us. No, it's not the case that Jesus was able to do all of this because he was God. It was possible for Jesus to do all of this because he was the obedient son of God and the son of man who was endowed and empowered with the Holy Spirit after his baptism. And it is after his baptism that his life, his words, his deeds were controlled by the power of the Holy Spirit to do uh, to the point where he could do what God wanted to get done. So how did Jesus do this? Is it nature or nurture? Researchers will suggest to you that resilience is both nature and nurture. There may well be some predisposition that some people have that enables them to endure suffering a lot better than other people. But research also suggests that whether you have this predisposition or not, what you do with your life experiences, the choices that you make with regards to those experiences will either make you better or bitter. And as a Christian, the Bible tells us that there is nothing that we go through that God does not meet us in. The Bible says that it is through suffering that we gain perseverance. Perseverance actually produces godly character. So the idea here is that it is not simply nature that develops a resilient spirit. It is actually the choices that you and I make in the suffering, in the valleys, to invite God into our suffering that enables us to slowly make the steps up that steep path. If you were to ask a number of people, how resilient is Craig? I think they would probably say, hey, he's pretty resilient. He handles stressful circumstances really, really well. And a number of people will think, well, that's just Craig. That's just the way he's wired. And again, there quite possibly is a genetic predisposition I have that means that I can stay calm and push through that some of you may not. But, but I want to tell you that that's basically not my story. My life hasn't been easy. I've experienced a, a lot of suffering, suffering that I would never have willingly signed up for. But the truth of it is, I can honestly stand here today and say, I am glad I went through this because of what God was producing in me. 
See, when I was young, I had more surgeries than soap operas have plot twists. <laughs> on the hip, on my ears, so many of them. I had so many surgeries on my ears that in about 1996, 97, the, the surgeon told me that I would need a hearing aid. So I spent about two years arguing with my own ego about whether as a 30-year-old man I would be willing to actually wear a hearing aid that everybody could see. I remember going to the audiologist at the age of 30, and about 2000 was the year, in the year 2000. Some of you are thinking, man, it's before I was born. Yeah, I'm that old, right? And I remember going in there and saying, I've wrestled with doing this. And the audiologist said to me, you know what? On average, it takes a man seven years before they are willing to acknowledge that they need a hearing aid. It took you two. You have done really, really well. <laughs> I didn't like it. I would often moan about all of this to my life coach, Vipka. <laughs> right? And she would just tell me, stop throwing a pity party. But let's be honest, who doesn't like a pity party every now and then, right? And the truth is, ministry wasn't that easy either. For some reason, God has called me to follow long-tenured pastors. And the situations have never been easy. And somebody said to me once, when you go in after a long-tenured pastor, it's kind of like buying a really old car and getting used to all its quirks. Every church is quirky. And you go in there after a long tenured pastor and you think, why do you do that? Oh, yeah, because we've always done it this way, right? And then the, the heart of ministry wasn't easy either. I still remember the day that I received that letter, and it was my first anonymous letter. Still remember what it made me think. Still remember how it made me feel. And then I remember the the person, even what she was wearing, who chewed me up and spat me out because she didn't like something. First time, still remember it. I remember the first time I went to an elders meeting in the 20s, and uh, it troubled me so much because of what was going on that I didn't sleep for weeks. And then I remember seeing the way that the church was responding to certain things, not just our church, but church in general, respond, responding to some of the concerns that young people had. And God put it on my heart to do a message that would encourage older people to listen to the concerns of the younger people. I was so concerned about this message that I had different groups praying for me, literally laying hands on me each and every day for the week leading up to it. Oh, and boy, was I chewed up and spat out on social media like never before. Went into the office the next day, and somebody said, well, Craig, you never wanted to be a media influencer, but you are now. The truth is, all of those situations, all of those circumstances, they troubled me more than they should have. They hit me harder than they should have. But I remember on one of those occasions, as I'm just going through all of this, and I'm thinking, what's the point? Right? What's the point? Why continue to do this thing, to try and do what God wants me to do when this is kind of all I get, you know, that kind of pity party? And, and in that moment, I just sense the Spirit of God taking me back to my call. If you've been around here long enough, you, you know I've shared this a number of times, Ezekiel wanted to. But I saw something in that moment in the valley that I'd never seen before. And it's the part where God said to the prophet Ezekiel, which I believe the Holy Spirit was applying to me, I will make your forehead as hard as flint. I will make your forehead as hard as stone. And in this moment, I realized that resilience is something that God said he would do. Not something that I would do. And in that moment, whatever genetic predisposition I had that some people may think makes it easier for me to face suffering than they do, well, it was basically God's work as I was willing to give my pain and my suffering and my challenges to him. And in this moment, 
God gave me peace. I would never have signed up for a lot of the things I've gone through. But I'm so glad I did. Because what God has done in me is making me more resilient, more peaceful, more calm through life storms. There's far more poise because I know this. God will vindicate Christ and his church. And that's enough. And the amazing thing in this story about John 19 is, is how Jesus just displays this. And as we go through this text over the next few weeks, I just pray that something of Jesus' resolve would be implanted in you so that you would know even in the valleys, God is with you. And it is never where he will leave you. Now, let's get practical and, and apply this, take it to the text. One of the things I, I, I discovered was that in those moments where I struggled the most with my suffering were the moments when I didn't want to be there, when I felt it was unfair that I was there. Now, think about it this way. How many of you have ever taken your kids on a hike and one of them has never wanted to go, right? Isn't it true that the kid who doesn't want to be there is the one who gets tired first? Right? <laughs> it's usually the way it is. It's like, well, why is that so surprising? Because when the path gets steep, there needs to be that inner resolve to keep on going when we think it's completely and utterly unfair. And this is where John 19 actually begins. It begins with a statement of Jesus being treated as a guilty party. But here's the reality. Seven times in the arrest and the trial of Jesus, and that leads to his crucifixion, seven times Jesus is pronounced as innocent. Now, if you know anything about scriptural numbers, you will know seven is the number of perfection. Seven times Jesus is declared to be innocent. So though he's guilty... He's actually declared innocent seven times. Judas, after he betrays Jesus, realizes what he's done. He said, this man has not done anything to deserve this. Pilate's wife, Herod, the thief on the cross, the centurion, the crowd, and even Pilate himself. Despite being declared innocent, Jesus was treated as guilty. Verse 1, then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. It's possible for us to misunderstand what's going on here. Uh, the flogging practice of the Romans, it had uh, three levels uh, to this. Uh, the first one was fustigatio. The second one was flagellation. You may be more familiar with that one. And the third one was verabatio. Each of these basically represented ascending levels of punishment. And so by the time we get to Mark chapter 15, which is the crucifixion scene where he was flogged, that is the worst type of verabatio. But at this point, commentators think that this is more likely to be fustigatio, which basically means it's a beating. Pilate is trying to navigate around the fact that the crowd is baying for blood. He wants to do something to appease their evil desires, but he knows that Jesus hasn't done anything. So what we have here is Jesus being treated as guilty even though the man who is ordering his beating knows he is innocent. How would you deal with a situation like that? Would you stay as calm as Jesus in a moment like that? Have you got the inner strength when things are going wrong, when it's unjust, when the hill is going up, to just stay calm and in control. It's a lot easier said than done, isn't it? I remember talking to a businessman who had been falsely accused in work of sabotaging a project of his colleague. Now, when we met, the challenge that man faced was the fact that he was innocent of this, but he was being treated as if he was guilty by a number of his colleagues. And he said that the emotional, the spiritual, the psychological pain of all of this was giving him an anxiety that he'd never had before. And so I said to him, what, what does the solution look like? He said, look, the solution looks like uh, that my manager basically declaring me to be innocent, 
finding me to be innocent, declaring me to be innocent so that everybody knows I did not do this and my credibility would be restored. Now, all of that eventually happened. But then he came back in after it happened, and we just talked about, hey, why were you so anxious when you were so right? What, what was going on here that was so important to you? You knew you were right. Let's, let's talk this through. Now, some of us, we go through circumstances, and we get anxious. It impacts us emotionally, psychologically, spiritually, and there's a draining anxiety. Some of us don't do that. What some of us do is we will fight to prove our innocence. Heard about um, a, a, a staff canteen where there were items disappearing from the f- refrigerator. And um, there was a letter posted on the wall of the staff room basically saying, hey, whoever's stealing all of these items, could you please stop it? And there was one particular guy who was really angry that people thought that he would steal the items. It was so general that he felt included, and he didn't like that. And so he made up his mind that he was going to prove his innocence. So he goes home, and he actually takes a stuffed toy, right, with a little camera in it, and he puts it in the refrigerator to find out who the culprit was. Do you know who it was? It was actually the custodian who was going through the refrigerator to take all of the expired food out of there to make sure that the refrigerator didn't stink. Well, that guy didn't get what he wanted. Kind of made him feel bad that he actually outdid the janitor for doing his job. There's a point here, right? The point is this. Knowing your innocence matters little unless you overcome the pain of the injustice committed against you. Just look at that for a second. Knowing you are right, as exemplified by Jesus in John 18 and 19, matters little unless you are able in the moment to overcome the pain of injustice that is being committed against you. What enabled Jesus to do that? Again, when... You ask a question of Jesus, what enabled him to stay so calm? We ask it of his two natures, right? But in his human nature, Jesus reveals that what enables him to stay so calm is because he knew that God would vindicate him. Earlier in John's gospel, John chapter 2, verses 19 through 21, Jesus is having an argument with the very people who would crucify him. And in that argument, Jesus says, destroy this temple, and I tell you, I will raise it in three days. Verse John 2, 19. Verse 20, the religious leaders listen to Jesus and say, what are you talking about? Build, rebuild it in three days. It took us 46 years to build this temple. And then in verse 21, it, uh, John makes a comment and says he wasn't talking about the temple. He was talking about his own body. But here's the point. In verse 22, we read that after Jesus was raised... The disciples understood what Jesus was talking about and realized in that moment he was talking about his own resurrection. In other words, Jesus knew in his humanity that God would vindicate him and raise him from the dead after he died. Now, nobody else knew it. Only Jesus knew this. Everybody else who was kind of like in the middle... Didn't know what was going on. I mean, who was he really? For many of them, all they saw was someone dying on a cross. The only person at that point who truly knew who he was and what would happen is Jesus himself. How many of you have ever been accused of wrong and the only one who knows you're right is you? That's all Jesus had. He knew that God would vindicate him when? After he'd died. Is that enough for you? Being vindicated, being proved right after you're dead. That's all he had. But see, vindication is a spiritually powerful tool. The resurrection is the vindication of the cross. 
But again, till that moment, the only person who knew that was Jesus. And then after the resurrection, all of a sudden, the people closest to him started to realize that that was true. So the, the vindication goes a, a little bit further, but it's still not universal. And then what we read in the story is that Jesus is actually raised, not only raised, but he ascends to the Father. Now, all of a sudden, he is vindicated in the heavenlies, and the ascension is the glorification of Jesus. In this moment, Jesus is vindicated in all of heaven, and he takes the seat at the right hand of the Father, and everyone knows, God knows what he's doing. And then what happens? Theology tells us that because Jesus ascended, because Jesus went up, what came down? The Holy Spirit comes down. This is the day of Pentecost. And what happens is the Holy Spirit reveals who Christ is to all of us. And now Jesus is subjectively vindicated in the hearts of all of those who call him Lord. But it's still subjective. But what we do know is that one day, Revelation 19 verse 16, everyone, everyone will acknowledge that he is king of kings and lord of lords. And in that moment, it will be objective once and for all. But until then, it's still subjective. How many of you, for how many of you do you struggle because people accuse you of things and you know, you know that this is not true? What happens on the inside is the fact that you know that you are innocent enough to keep you calm. What do you do with the pain of the injustice? Does it make you bitter or does it make you better? Now, I'm beginning to realize the resilience, and can I say this as a Wesleyan pastor, Lynn, close your ears. <laughs> Resilience is like a fine wine. It takes an awful lot of time to mature, and it's a bitter taste in your mouth. I don't know about you, but I don't want to be bitter. I want to be better. I want to be more like Jesus. And in order to be more like Jesus, I basically need to remember that he embraced his suffering because he knew that God would vindicate him. And this is the message of the gospel that we preach. Romans 4.25, we couple the cross and the resurrection together. We basically read this. He was delivered over to death for our sins, and he was raised to life for our justification. This is the vindication of the crucifixion. Jesus rose because the Father vindicated who he was, Romans 1.4, and what he did, Romans 4.25. And one day, Jesus looks forward to the day where he will be vindicated publicly before all people. Jesus remained calm because he knew that God would vindicate him. Can you? There were a group of leaders I met with one time who had to make a really difficult church decision, and they had to keep the details quiet. And they kept the details quiet, but the only problem was that meant that a lot of people were basically going at them from every direction possible. And I remember one night joining them in prayer as the pain was there and a number of them were crying because they knew what was going on. Nobody else did. And in that moment, the comfort that came to that group of people was knowing that God knew. God knew. And that one day, at the believer's judgment, they would be vindicated once and for all. And the amazing work of the Spirit in that moment was that there was no bitterness, there was no anger, there was just peace. Is that you? When you go through suffering, when you go through hardship, are you at peace? Now, I'm not saying in all of this, right, that peace and stillness and not confronting wrong is always the right response to injustice. Of course it's not. In John chapter 19, we'll discover at one point, Jesus doesn't remain silent. He actually speaks to Pilate. He corrects Pilate's understanding of his own authority. Jesus wasn't always silent, but he was always still. See, when you have that inner poise that knows that God knows, God knows you. 
It enables you to stay calm when everything else is chaotic. And in that moment, you're able to discern what God wants you to say and what God wants you to do. This is what Jesus does. And if you look at it, if you think about this, how many of the scriptures, especially the Psalms, actually talk about this this wrestle that we have with delayed vindication? This idea of suffering is not always that people accuse us, right? Sometimes it's physical things. After the first service, I spoke to a woman who was going through a really hard battle with cancer. That woman actually spoke and said, I am learning how important it is to have a calm and peaceable spirit. One day, all things will be made right. We wrestle with this. So much of the scriptures are about this this delay. And if you know the gospel story, the reason for the delay is for more people to have a chance of voluntarily accepting Christ as Lord in this life so that they don't bow the knee involuntarily, Philippians 2, 5 through 11, in the next. There's a reason for the delay. But that reason actually costs us. It means we suffer And all too often, the psalmists, especially Psalm 37, Psalm 73, you can read it at home, they are wrestling with the fact that why is it that the righteous suffer and the wicked prosper? Why? And I love Psalm 37, 7 through 9. Look at the encouragement here. Be still before the Lord. Wait patiently for him. Do not fret when people succeed in their ways, when they carry out their wicked schemes. It's as if this is a subtext to to John 19, isn't it? Refrain from anger. Turn away from wrath. Do not fret. It only leads to evil. For those who are evil, look at this is the hope, for those who are evil will be destroyed, but those who hope in the Lord will inherit the land. Note the realization the psalmist comes to. In time... Justice will be served, and I will wait patiently and stillfully in that time. So I think as we begin this series, the, the, the challenge that I want us to embrace is that God meets us wherever we are. And that God wants us to be resilient because Jesus said to his disciples in the upper room as he's praying, John 16, Jesus says, listen, in this world you will have trouble. That's a guarantee. That's a promise. In this world, all of us will suffer. We may be on the mountaintop right now, but as was said in that spoken word earlier on, at some point, we'll find ourselves in a valley soon enough unless Jesus comes again. But while we're there, when we're there, let's have the resolve that Jesus had. Let's realize that there is no situation that we are in that God is not there with us. Let's recognize that God will vindicate us, even if that vindication is delayed. Two thoughts as we wrap up. Firstly, through the series, we're going to discover a principle, and that principle is pretty simple. It's if good things ever come to us, it's because somebody else paid the price. If good things ever come to us, it's because somebody else paid the price. This story through John 19 reminds us that Jesus paid an incredible price in order for us to receive an incredible gift. Good things, great things are seldom free. And if you're here enjoying life and you haven't had to pay for it, then it usually means somebody else has. Every time I'm on on the stage, I, I think about the privilege that we have of even worshiping in a space like this. It's possible because the previous generation actually sacrificed to make it possible. If we ever receive a good thing, it's because someone paid the price. We're receiving a good thing of salvation because Jesus was willing to pay the price. Let's learn to appreciate him for that. Secondly, what John 19 will tell us is that John 19 is followed by John 20. What that basically means is you'll never reach the mountain if you quit too soon. You'll never reach the mountain if you quit too soon. You'll never be able to experience the wonder of God meeting you in your suffering if you quit too soon. Some of us, I think, are in a period of suffering and we're tempted to quit. I'm fascinated by Hebrews 12. Hebrews 12, 2. 
Jesus endured the cross for the joy set before him. What was the joy set before him? Personally, it was knowing that his father would vindicate him. But there was another joy that he had before him. It was knowing that his suffering would ultimately bring meaning and life to all of those, all of us, who would ultimately come to faith in him. Hebrews 12 is actually being written to a group of Jews who are being persecuted by uh, Jewish Christians, who are being persecuted by Jews, and they were tempted to walk back because they wondered whether their pain and their suffering was actually worth what they were actually experiencing. And so the author of Hebrews writes this to remind them that there is joy coming. He is saying, listen, however hard it is, don't quit too soon, because if you quit too soon, you'll never enjoy the wonder of the sight. In February 2014, a few months before we moved up to Holland, Vipka and I had the privilege of climbing Mount Kinabalu, which is a mountain in Malaysia. Now, what's fascinating about this mountain is that it's 4,000 meters. When you put it, when you think that seems high, right? And it's half the size of Everest, and all of a sudden it doesn't seem so high at all. It's above 14,000 feet. It's located on the uh, Malaysian island of Borneo. Now, what's fascinating about this, uh, this mountain is that it goes through three different types of terrain. Firstly, it goes through uh, rainforests. Then it goes through glacial rock. And then thirdly, it goes through alpine meadows. And because it goes through all of the different types of terrain, what happens is the, the weather fluctuations are actually really significant. So on the first day, Vipka and I were walking up in shorts and a t-shirt, and on the second day, we were basically kitted out in full winter gear. It, it's just a strange place. Now, it's a two-day hike, and at the end of the first day, I was exhausted. <laughs> Somebody wasn't, the one taking the picture. This is about five in the afternoon. I was done for the day, and I can justify that because in order to get to the peak at the summit, we had to get up really early, and we were walking out of the door before 3 a.m. to make sure that we were climbing the last eight or 900 feet until we got to the summit. But this was the hard part because up there, the air gets really thin. It's not easy. Of course, Mrs. Marathon Runner over there is ready for this. She's way up ahead, and I'm walking a little bit slowly behind her. And what was amazing to me is how many people were tempted to quit. They were so close, but the air was so thin that many of them contemplated not carrying on. I'm glad I carried on because the view at the top, as the sun is coming up, and you can see so far, was a view that I'll never forget. But I only got that view because I did not quit. If there's one thing that we should be amazed about in John chapter 19, is that Jesus did not quit. And because he didn't, we can receive the strength that we need when life gets steep to actually keep moving forward. And yes, you may look around and you may think, you know what, I haven't got the genetic predisposition of the people I'm sitting around. I, I don't know whether I can do this thing. But the good news here is that if you are a follower of Jesus, it is not about your genetic predisposition. It is actually about whether you have received the gift of Jesus and the gift of the Holy Spirit. And if you have, and you're willing to say, okay, God, I don't like the pain that I'm going through, but I'm willing to submit my life experience to you. In that moment, you welcome the Holy Spirit into your life, and he will give you the strength to take the next step. That's how you move from the valley to the mountaintop. That's how you move from the valley to the highland. Let me encourage you through this series. Marvel at the work of Jesus, but marvel more that through the finished work of Jesus, there is nowhere that God cannot meet you. There is nothing that God will not take you through. Open your heart to him because he loves you, accepts you, and meets you where he finds you. Stand with me. We're going to sing a song that basically echoes that. And I pray that you would... Sing these words out. Some of you are introverts. You don't like singing. You like being sung over. Just listen to these words. 
And let's just invite God into our experience so that the Holy Spirit would give us the strength to keep going when life gets deep. Father, I thank you for the finished work of Jesus. I thank you for the example he sets us. And I thank you, Father, that through faith, his example can become our experience because Jesus went up, the Holy Spirit came down. We can walk in strength and power, not in our own strength, but in the strength that you provide. Father, as we journey towards Easter, may we be overcome, overwhelmed, by the gift of love that you have demonstrated to us. But may we also, Father, be awestruck with Jesus' willing obedience to endure the cross for the joy of knowing all of us would have the ability to overcome the weight of sin that holds us down. Father, we thank you for the gift of our salvation. And we pray as we just sing this song that you would give us the strength to endure anything that comes against us by inviting you in and welcoming you into our struggle. Father, we love you and we thank you that you meet us where you find us.
This kind of love is who you are. It's a grace I could never ask to be somebody you still want. So you love me as you find. Our prayer for you is that being rooted and established in love, together with all of God's holy people, you would be able to grasp how high, how long, how deep, and how wide is the love of Christ. We love you deeply. We invite you back for part two of our series, Highland, next week. Walk in the love of Christ. We'll see you next time.